Please send us your phones. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you for joining us as we celebrate this day of women. Today, we are celebrating 11 new Democratic women in our caucus, including Delegate Kelly Fowler of Virginia Beach, who has introduced a resolution proclaiming this day a day of women. Today is a reminder of the progress we have made in the change that's still yet to come. Many of the women standing with me have always been involved in their communities, and they were motivated to run after an election in 2016 that normalized misogyny and brought down our political discourse. They took the next step and got elected. First they marched, then they ran, and now they serve in the People's House. Our caucus is made up of strong women and our male allies who have put forth legislation that will advance women. <coughs> Today we're rolling out bills that promote reproductive health and freedom and address sexual harassment and assault. Now we're going to hear from these phenomenal women and who they are delegates who I always say have persisted. Uh, we will first hear from Delegate Corey. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It's not a microphone. It, 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 it's on. Okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, this, is, this is an incredible morning. And because I didn't expect to go first, I might not give the overall introduction that that would have been given. I have been representing the 38th district, which is Annandale Falls Church, for, well, this is my ninth year. I've also been co-chairing the Women's Reproductive Health Care Caucus for, I think, six years with uh, Senator Barbara Pagola. So this issue of reproductive health care is something that's always been front and center for me. And every time I talk about it or ask questions of individuals about what their situation is, I learn more upsetting facts about the way reproductive health care is covered in Virginia and treated in our country. Therefore, I have introduced HB 21, which is models on the Oregon statute of health care access, reproductive health care access for all. Essentially, HB 21 makes it illegal to deny coverage to anybody, reproductive health care coverage to anybody on any basis. It also makes it illegal to discriminate in terms of fees and availability of coverage for reproductive health care. And that is really important. Many, many women find that in fact, when they go to pick up their prescription, there is no copay from the insurance company and they have to pay the whole fee, especially if it is birth control. And this has been <coughs> happening also to women, more to women of color and more to transgender women. In order to further HB 21, I also have another bill, 631, which requires employers who opt out of offering reproductive health care coverage to notify their employees specifically, not buried in 20 pages of small print, and also to inform the State Bureau of Insurance who will post it on their website. So these are my efforts this year to push our cause forward, and I am really pleased to be able to speak to you on this day for women. Thank you. and I represent the 2nd District and Prince William in Stafford. So, the legislation that I am co-patroning with Delicate Boisco is to get rid of the sales tax on menstrual products like tampons. They don't want you to talk, I don't want to talk about all the other bills that I have um, that will benefit women because I want to bring this to the forefront. This is something that is very important. Um, it is a, a tax on tampons. It's, it's nothing more than a woman's penalty. People often ask, what is the benefit of having so many women that were just elected to the General Assembly? And my answer is really simple. We're here to have a seat at the table and push our interests and things that's important to women to the forefront of the conversation, to fight from the front and not the back. And so that's why we're here. 
representing women's interests. And I'm proud to call myself an advocate for that. As one of the first females and African American females to graduate from Virginia Military Institute, I am very familiar with fighting for women's equality and fairness and equal access. And so I am privileged to be with all of these women to fight for women's equity and women's rights. Thank you. Um, good morning, thank you for being here today. I'm Kathy Tran and I represent the 42nd District in the Virginia House of Delegates. I'm here to talk about one of my two pieces of legislation that I'm introducing to combat sexual harassment in Virginia. Over the last few months, more and more women have had the courage to come out and share their experiences of being sexually harassed at work, in public spaces, and in their personal lives. The Me Too movement brings a powerful reminder that sexual harassment is not new and continues to be an epidemic. We cannot tolerate this behavior anymore and we must do all we can to combat it. The legislation I'm introducing tackles sexual harassment in the workplace. House Bill 1462 directs the Department of Human Resource Management to create an online training module on sexual harassment that would be available to all employees and agencies within the Commonwealth. Further, and equally importantly, the bill requires that all state contractors inform and train their employees on their sexual harassment policies. In tackling sexual harassment in the workplace, training is an important and necessary first step. We cannot have a strong and productive workforce if we don't have safe workplaces. So I look forward to working with all of my colleagues to make sure that we're moving forward on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vivian Watts, House, um, 39th House District, building on Delegate Tran's uh, bill for all workplaces. I am focusing on the workplace of the General Assembly. The House of Delegates falls on the workplace under the workplace harassment policy of all state agencies. However, that state policy encourages supplemental provisions to meet specific needs. And if there ever was a unique workplace, the legislature is it. HB 1043 seeks to protect all who work for the General Assembly, full-time staff members, session aides, volunteer interns, and equally important, to protect all who have business before the legislature, citizens, contractors, professional lobbyists, members of the press. It incorporates the language that's been in state policy since 2014 to strictly forbid harassment on the basis of race, sex, color, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, veteran status, political affiliation, genetics, or disability. 1043 covers legislators' action while carrying out official duties year-around, not just when the assembly is in session, and also covers actions during a campaign. It requires that basic policies be adopted for mandatory training, readily accessible public notice on how to report uh, harassment, and clear lines of responsibility for dealing with any report, which starts with the responsibility of each manager, including General Assembly members, to protect his or her employees from harassment in their workplace, no matter what the source, and includes the responsibility to initiate formal investigations should the need arise. I want to underscore that the intent of 1043 is to be preventative, whether the perpetrator comes from inside or from outside the legislative branch. It also underscores, however, that every member must fully recognize the position of power our office embodies, both actual power and perceived power, and that every member has a significant burden to ensure that our actions never abuse that power. Hello, I'm Delegate Carrie Delaney, serving in the 67th House District, which is Fairfax and Loudoun Counties. Um, during my career, I have served as a sexual assault crisis counselor, so I am deeply passionate about raising the voices of women and ensuring that victims are never silenced. 
Uh, due to this, I am uh, introducing House Bill 1561, which aims to close the legal sexual predator loophole where victims of sexual harassment and assault are silenced by the issuance of a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, HB 1561 provides the victim of sexual violence or uh, harassment with legal counsel while executing a non-disclosure agreement, allowing them to access, uh, allowing them access to proper legal advice when weighing the options of whether they want to remain silent about their assault or harassment. <clears throat> this uh, legal counsel will be used to ensure that the victim's interests are at the heart of the non-disclosure agreement process, and that this process protects them rather than the perpetrator. NDAs have been used as weapons for the powerful to keep vulnerable people silent. They allow sexual predators to continue to, vic to victimize the innocent. Uh, 1561 will give power back to the victim, will make predators more accountable for their actions, and will place the interests of a non-disclosure agreement with the victim, not the perpetrator. When predators are able to buy the silence of their victims, we as a society pay the price allowing more innocent people to become victims of sexual violence. It is time to close this sexual predator loophole and protect our citizens who are victims of sexual harassment and violence. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Eileen Hiller Horn, and I represent the 41st District in the House of Delegates, and it's an honor and privilege for me to stay here with, uh, with our so many colleagues and with all of you. Since my first election nearly eight years ago, I spent a lot of time focusing on campus sexual assault, assault and, um, and reporting in particular, and I focused on, um, on the punishment aspect of it for so long. And it was a couple years ago that I decided, rather than focusing so much on punishment, let's move forward and talk about prevention. And that's exactly what I did by uh, introducing some legislation focused around age-appropriate evidence-based curricula. Uh, talking about domestic violence, sexual assault, healthy relationships, and also the law and meaning of consent. And uh, so today I'm here to uh, mention two specific bills, HB 44, reducing or actually removing the permissiveness around teaching consent in high school FLE. Uh, to be frank, it makes no sense to have this permissive um, section in the family life cur curriculum, and it's all about education earlier. I also have HB 44, uh, which is uh, known as my boundaries bill. Again, talking about age-appropriate evidence-based curricula focused around uh, boundaries and personal space. Again, rather than wait till high school, we need to start earlier and educating earlier to, uh, uh, to, uh, to educate our young and young students, teach them about privacy, teach them about boundaries and what's acceptable, um, not just healthy relationships. At this point, I'd also like to mention that um, my colleague who's with us today, Rip Sullivan, has introduced HB 522, which would create a safe harbor for sexual assault survivors and witnesses who are underage drinking or using illegal, um, illegal drugs at the time of attack. Obviously, we up here believe strongly that no one should fear reporting an assault to the police due to potential prosecution for underage drinking. I'm pleased to co uh, to co patron this bill with Delegate Rip Sullivan. And I'd like to also just specifically mention that Rip and um, all of the men in our caucus are true allies in this fight with all of us. Uh, protecting women is not a red or blue issue. I believe it's bipartisan, and it's my hope that we can truly work together to make Virginia a safer, more secure place for all women. Thank you. I represent the 86th district, that's Herndon, Park Chantilly, Oak Hill, and Sterling Park. Today is the 45th anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court case, Roe v. Wade, which recognized the constitutional right to privacy extends to a woman's right to make her own medical decisions, including the decision to have an abortion without interference from politicians, most of whom are men. 45 years later, 7 in 10 Americans believe that Roe v. Wade should remain the law of the land. And in Virginia, this constitutional right is threatened by laws restricting abortion, creating sharp disparities in access to health care, including in access to abortion care. My bill, the Whole Women's Health, which is the second time I've carried this bill, first year, it did not even get a hearing before the Court of Justice Committee, provides that any statute that places a burden on access to abortion without conferring a legitimate health benefit is unenforceable. Since the Roe v. Wade decision, more than a dozen medically unnecessary restrictions have been passed in Virginia, making it more difficult to obtain an abortion. Since 2010, 
the Virginia General Assembly has proposed over 75 restrictions on women's reproductive health care. The United States Supreme Court in the whole women's health, the Hellerstadt case, ruled that medically unnecessary restrictions on abortion <coughs> are unconstitutional. And my bill, the whole women's health, eliminates all the medically <coughs> unnecessary procedures and processes, including the performance of an ultrasound or the 24-hour waiting period. Leading medical experts and organizations strongly oppose medically unnecessary restrictions on women's health care services. It is politicians, not doctors, who are pushing <coughs> sham restrictions on women's ability to access abortion. And I, I will say it again, most of these politicians are men who will never have to have this decision for themselves. A woman, we all know in this room, including the gentleman standing behind me, is fully capable of making thoughtful decisions about her family, her future, and her health. And I pr proudly stand up with my colleagues to enable women to make these decisions with their health care providers without the interference from politicians who presume to know better. Thank you. recognizes the anniversary of Roe v. Wade as the Day of Tears. Also last year, a record number of women stepped up, spoke out, and took their seat at the table. I am proud to stand alongside Deborah Rodman and the other Democratic freshman delegates and many other supportive delegates to sponsor and present House Resolution 14, establishing January 22nd as the Day of Women in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and to encourage Virginia to celebrate women in leadership. We will not be silenced, we will not be shamed, and we urge Virginians to call your delegate and tell them that you want this resolution passed and that women are not gonna be silenced. Thank you. chair and this incredible amount of women there in our caucus and the men that stand behind us and support us. Um, I, I can't say anymore. It's a beautiful ending, Kelly. Thank you. And thank you all so much for being here. And uh, I think that's it. I appreciate it. Any questions? Any questions? Questions? I guess we, if we have time. Members yeah. of the press, any quick questions? Graham? The other side, the Republicans haven't put in as many anti-abortion bills this year as they have in the past. Can comment on what that trend means? you see that as sort of a permanent shift in what they're going to focus on or more of a temporary They role? saw us what? coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, right, and I, I, don't think, I don't think it's anything that's a permanent shift. It's just, look at the sheer numbers, and I think that's what makes for good policy. Virginia has been the leader, I think, what we're going to see nationwide is more women in state legislatures, more women in Congress. It makes for better policy making. It makes for better conversation. We have more diversity at the table. Any other questions from the press? If you are interested in a one-on-one -on -one, real quickly before our